بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في العرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف This is our third lesson on transcendent philosophy but we are still studying the first uh, chapter of the book. Uh, the very last part in the first chapter is about the thinkers who have influenced Mullah Sadra. The author says that um, naturally every philosopher, directly or indirectly, is influenced by people who have discussed common topics. So, for example, if you talk about substance, if you talk about mind, if you talk about existence, so whoever in the past has discussed this and their opinions are available, uh, directly or indirectly, they have influence on us. But what we mean here is not this kind of general influence. We want to refer to the people that had lots of influence in the sense that you find their names are mentioned or their works are quoted or you know referred to their opinions. And some of them maybe Mullah Sadra had a, you know great love for them and appreciation. So what we want to discuss is about uh, to see who are the people, the thinkers that had uh, lots of influence on Mullah Sadra's works and opinions and development, either favorably or sometimes Mullah Sadra was not in favor of their opinions, but had to consider their opinions and criticize them. But he frequently refers to them, he was familiar with their opinions, etc. So, briefly, Mullah Sadra was influenced a lot by these people. One, Ibn Sina. Two, of course, I'm not saying in order. Uh, Aflutin, not Aflatu, not Plato, Platinus, Aflutin. Three, Ibn Arabi. Four, Sheikh Ishraq, Sukhrabardi. Five and six, Jalaluddin Dawani and Fakhruddin al-Razi. These are six people who had greatest influence on uh, uh, Mullah Sadra's works. He had, uh, of course, sympathy more towards Ibn Sina and Aflutin. He had uh, lots of respect for Sheikh Shahab al-Din al-Suhrawardi, for Ibn Arabi. But when it comes to Fakhr al-Razi and Jalaluddin al-Dawani, it's more a matter of uh, being critical and not being happy with their critique of Ibn Sina. And he wants to defend. Inshallah, we'll talk about each of them in more, a little bit more details. So let's go to each of these. Uh, first, Sheikh Ubudiyah talks about Aflutin. Uh, you might have heard the book Ethologia. This book, Ethologia, has been very well received by many Muslim philosophers. And they thought it belongs to Aristotle. And it's different from some other works of Aristotle. Recent research shows that this 
might not belong to Aristotle. It belongs actually to Aflutin, Platinus. And it has lots of uh, ideas which Mullah Sadra uh, was interested in. For example, many times when he proves his own um, claims, then he quotes from pathologia as a kind of evidence, extra evidence, the kind of support he quotes uh, phrases from pathologia. As an example, in volume one, in volume two, volume three, volume six of Al Aswar, we have quotations. Uh, that refer to pathologia. The next person is Ibn Sina. When it comes to pathologia, please listen very carefully. When it comes to pathologia, you find Ibn, uh, sorry, Mullah Sadra refers to pathologia when he talks about his uh, specific opinions. When it comes to Ibn Sina, he refers more when he talks about common opinions among philosophers. Because Ibn Sina was at that time like a mainstream, although Sheikh Ishraq was also there, but maybe the mainstream was, or at least the most dominant was, uh, you know, Ibn Sina and Aristotelian approach, peripatetic philosophers. So in Andi Shahai Khas, in his specific ideas, he refers to Pathologia. In Andi Shahaya Am, in general thoughts, he refers more to Ibn Sina. He has great respect for Ibn Sina and he doesn't find anyone to be as brilliant, as intelligent, as genius as Ibn Sina. Uh, he says uh, in Al Mabda or Al Ma'ad, volume. One page hundred forty six, Zakao, his intelligence and you know sharpness. Alladi la yordalu bihi zakaun. There is no other intelligence like that of Ibn Sina. He's very intelligent. Sometimes he calls Ibn Sina. Among philosophers, he is the one who has more knowledge. Sometimes he says, The best recent philosopher. Sometimes he says, Ibn Sina is one of the greatest philosophers of Islamic era. Sometimes he says Raisul Philosopher is the head of leader, head of philosophers. And sometimes he says he is Rasikh Fil Hikmah. It's very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk in the Quran about Rasikhuna Fil Ilm. Those who are very established and firm in knowledge. So he says, Mullah Sadr says, Ibn Sina is rasikh dar hikmat fil hikmah. Sometimes he says, tiz fahm. Very sharp. Sometimes he says, latif tab. Ibn Sina's disposition is very subtle and gentle. Even in you know, in Aswar, he, in volume two, he says, Mullah Sadra, he says that Ibn Sina is one of his spiritual fathers and one of his intellectual ancestors. A spiritual, one of his spiritual fathers and intellectual ancestors. In the issue of about the unity of the intellect and uh, the one who intellects and what is intellected. 
when he finds that Ibn Sina doesn't seem to offer adequate solution, he becomes despaired. Means that he has lots of hope in Ibn Sina. Sheikh Obudiyat says that according to some survey, Mullah Sadra has referred or quoted Ibn Sina 500 times in his works for different reasons. Sometimes for what we call estishahad, to bring some evidence as support, extra support. He says, Mullah Sadra says that Ibn Sina also has said this. But he brings his own argument, but he says, we can also mention Ibn Sina's opinion. Sometimes he quotes Ibn Sina and his ideas in order to explain them. So the first was istishad, the second is tawdi, to explain. Sometimes he quotes Ibn Sina and his opinions in order to defend them against the critics of Fakhr Razi, and Muhaqqaq Dawani and sometimes Sheikh Ishraq, because we will mention Sheikh Ishraq was critical of Ibn Sina. And sometimes also he mentions Ibn Sina and he has criticism because he's an independent thinker, although he loves Ibn Sina. We mentioned how much he admires Ibn Sina, but he's a mujtahid in philosophy and he has his ideas as well. Uh, I said this before, I repeat it again, because this is very important, maybe till end of the course, I will say it several times. To have a new opinion is not a problem. It's not necessarily a good thing. It depends on the truth. <laughs> but, because there are different opinions, you know, so we don't know who is true or not unless we go through the issue. So if you have a new opinion, this as such is not a bad thing, it's not also a good thing. You can have a new opinion. The main thing is that you have qualifications, you have well studied, you have had good teachers, you have discussed it. The second thing is it should come with respect for the previous scholars. It should come with respect for the tradition that you owe to that tradition. If you love Allah Miya Taba Tabai, for example, in Tafsir, and try to learn from him, you pray for him, you find him as a great inspiration for yourself, and then you have different opinions, like Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, he may have different Tafsiri opinions, this is not bad, this is good. He is respectful, he loves him, he has spent years understanding what Allama says, he was a student of Allama, but sometimes he has different opinions, that's great. But if you underestimate your Ustad or as other scholars, and say they all, you know, were going the wrong direction, they didn't understand what their ideas are not, you know, good, they're shallow, etc. I have a better opinion. No, this is not good. This makes lots of questions, brings lots of questions. Although still it's possible that this person may say something right. We don't say you are wrong, definitely. Still we look into what he says, we look into the arguments, and after that we can say what he says is right or wrong. But this approach is wrong, and for sure, most of the time, such people make mistakes. Because when you don't appreciate a scholarship and tradition, then you make lots of mistakes. People over 14 centuries have worked hard. Genius people, pious people, hardworking people, thousands of people have worked hard, and now we benefit from what they have left for us. They can have made mistake, Ejma is not hoja for us, but 
it's very unlikely that a person disregards all these people and then in every mas'ala or in most of mas'ala, he understands better. It's not possible. So, Ibn Sina is mentioned, is referred to by Mullah Sadra sometimes for esteshad as a kind of extra support evidence, sometimes for Tozi to explain, sometimes to defend against critics of Ibn Sina. And sometimes he himself may have different opinion. But then he wants to criticize Ibn Sina. It's a very important point. When he wants to criticize Ibn Sina, he is very careful. Sheikh Ubudiyat says, Be sabab diqqat bi nazir ibn Sina dar bahs ba ihtiyat pish mi rabad. Because ibn Sina was very careful in his discussion. He's, ibn Sina can make mistake, he's not ma'asum. But you cannot easily say ibn Sina made mistake. If you see in one place Ibn Sina has made mistake, read it again, read it again, read it again, ask other people, because he's not ma'asum, but the chance of you understanding better than Ibn Sina is much less than Ibn Sina understanding. Even someone like Mullah Sadra, when wanted sometimes to criticize or disagree with Ibn Sina, he was doing ihtiyat and he was expanding the discussion so that the reader can see whether he has understood Ibn Sina well or not, whether his critique you know, is in place, right place or not. Uh, some of you have heard uh, from me this story. It's a very important story. They say Sheikh Ansari at some point decided not to teach anymore. His students asked him what happened. You know, those were close to him. You know, he could ask this. He said, "I received a letter." The writer of this letter had criticized some of my opinions. And when I read it, I found that he has not understood what I have said. My worry is that in our lectures, we sometimes criticize opinions of other ulama. Especially those, and this is my, I'm saying in brackets, for example, those who are not teachers of Sheikh Ansari. So Sheikh Ansari reading their books is criticizing sometimes, disagreeing with them with respect. But he says, when I read what this person has understood from my positions, I thought maybe I'm doing the same mistake. Maybe I disagree with some people because I have not understood what they said. So it's better if I don't you know, teach, because if I want to teach, I have to refer to opinions of other people, and I don't want to be unfair. Look at his taqwa, his carefulness. And then some of his teachers said something which changed his opinion. They said, our case is different from that person. You study their opinions. You do your best to understand as a great teacher. Plus, you present your opinion. You say, you know, I understood, for example, what Akhund the Khurasani says in this way. You present it to hundreds of the scholars, many of them are mujtahids. 
They all are familiar with this text. They can check what you say. If you make mistake, they tell you that we think he didn't uh, mean this. He meant something else. It's very much different from someone who is sitting at home and read something and then says, my opinion is this. This person made mistake without discussing with anyone. Therefore, I always say, you know, people who have different opinions, if there are speakers, if there are, you know, uh, scholars who have different opinions, it's not a problem. For example, they have issues with Arbaeen, they have issues with, uh, you know, do I not or etc. Okay, you can have questions, you can have open, but don't say this as something definite, number one. And don't say to the public be before discussing this with academic circles. Find few scholars who are better than you, higher than you, or at least equal to you. Not to tell to your students that they are influenced by you already. Say to independent scholars who are at your level or better. Discuss with them. Even if your idea if doesn't change, at least you can say, I discussed this, I tried, but I was not convinced. Between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I did my best to find the truth, but still, this is my idea. Not that you rush and you know just go and say to a member or say to your own innocent students and you know they can get confused so ibn sina is very important for mullah sadra very very important but still mullah sadra sometimes may disagree but he does it with ihtiyat and respect and explains to scholars why he disagrees. The third person that influenced Mullah Sadra is Ibn Arabi in mystical thoughts. Ibn Arabi is a great figure in theoretical mysticism, Erfan Nazari. And he sometimes uses Ibn Arabi's ideas for solving or explaining philosophical issues. He argues philosophically, but then refers to mystical findings of Ibn Arabi and says, this is a kind of evidence. The same thing that we have understood through reasoning and arguing, Ibn Arabi also has mentioned. The fourth person is Shaykh Ishraq, Suhrawardi, Shahab al-Din Suhrawardi. His Suluk Hakimane, his conduct as a philosopher, as a Hakim, is very much appreciated by Mullah Sadra. It's interesting. He has interest in Ibn Sina. He has interest in Sheikh Ishraq, although Sheikh Ishraq is critical of Ibn Sina, but he sees value in both. He is not biased. He doesn't say, because I love Ibn Sina, whatever Sheikh Ishraq says you know, is wrong or uh, worse than that. Sometimes people even question personality of people, character of people when they disagree. No, he says Sheikh Ishraq is a great man. Sheikh Ishraq, as you know, he didn't stop using intellectual discourse. His method was rational. He was using badihiyata agli, those things that are self-evident and we can understand by our own intellect. 
and he was not replacing argument with cash for shahood or with mystical findings. He was not replacing that. But he was saying that a philosopher, in addition to his philosophical work, must be concerned with his own spirituality, with purity of the soul. And if even possible, it's better if he himself can have cash for shahood, but not replacing estadilal with cash for shahood. He says a philosopher should have both sides. Saying a hakim, so he was discussing philosophical ideas like other philosophers, but he wanted to also encourage people to have mystical, spiritual approach, and plus consider mystical findings as a kind of evidence, as a kind of thing to check, not as a replacement. He had the idea that if a philosopher suffers from Hawaii nafs, from the lower desires of the soul, then cannot understand or very is very unlikely to understand properly. It's better to say it this way. Mullah Sadra also loves this kind of emphasis on spirituality and purification of the soul. And he himself also recommends this to his readers. Mullah Sadra also praises Sheikh Ishraq for his intelligence and his very sharp uh, understanding. These people were very genius, even if they disagreed with each other, with each other but they were genius. They had, you know, lots of years of study, reflection. It's not that, you know, every person, you know, uh, comes and says, you know, I have an opinion. These people were very special people. Number five and six, Imam al-Razi. They call him Imam al-Mushakkikin, but some people, maybe they are very happy with him, so for them, he's the leader. And Muhaqqiq Dawani, Jalaluddin Dawani. Sometimes in Bidayatul Hikmah and Nahayatul Hikmah, uh, Jalaluddin Dawani is mentioned. Why Mullah Sadra talks about them and refers to them and is somehow influenced by them? Because he is very much in favor of their opinions? No. Because because they had lots of criticism against Ibn Sina. And many of these criticisms are misunderstandings. But the doubts that they raised were very helpful. Uh, Ayatollah Mutahari also says this, that, you know, these uh, people, uh, with the doubts they created, with the criticism, they helped philosophers indirectly. Not that their ideas helped philosophers, but their criticism helped the philosophers to strengthen their arguments and check if there is any, you know, gap, any problem in their arguments. They could, you know, uh, fortify their arguments. They could, you know, strengthen them better, make their arguments better. Many times, their criticism led to development of new philosophical ideas. Sheikh Ishraq also somehow plays same role. Although he was himself a philosopher, but his criticism of Ibn Sina is also helpful. Because then Mullah Sadra tries to defend uh, the position of Ibn Sina, for example, or understand something new. Then he says, Sheikh Ubudiyat. He says, 
maybe this is not an exaggeration. He doesn't say definitely, but he says maybe this is not an exaggeration. That two of the most fundamental issues in transcendent philosophy, which I ask any of you, you know, to list some of the foundations of Islamic uh, philosophy in the form of transcendent uh, philosophy, you would list. One is asalatul wujud, one is tashkik fil wujud. Primordiality of existence and greatness of existence. Greatness of existence. Sheikh uh, Ubudiyat says maybe there is no exaggeration in saying that these two important foundations of transcendent philosophy are developed by Mullah Sadra after trying to evaluate such criticisms. It's very interesting. So if those critics were not there, maybe he was not able to understand this. In our tradition, this is also a very good thing that we should keep it, we should preserve it. When ulama had respect for someone, they write comments on that person's work and express their opinions. Maybe they differ, but because they found that text valuable from a valuable scholar, they think it's a good text to express our agreements and disagreements. Many people, for example, chose Tajrid, Tajrid al etagad by Khaja, and commented on that. But not that they necessarily accepted with Khaja. They may accept it. They may. Or many people have comments on Urbatul Wusqa. <coughs> but they are mushtahs, they have their opinions, they many times differ. But this is because of the value of this text. So in our tradition, if I comment on someone's books, it means that I respect that person and I find it valuable. So I mention my agreements and disagreements. But sometime today, uh, when people, you know, comment, the author gets angry or upset, you know, why you are, you know, disagreeing with me or what you're commenting on my book and what, you know, why you, why you make, you know, in your book review, you know, these points that are against my ideas. And on the other hand, also those who comment should be doing this with love, with appreciation, not just mention bad things. Also mention good things there. Which comments should not be just negative. So, Alhamdulillah, we managed to complete the first chapter. Inshallah, we we'll start the second chapter, which is about the development of transcendent philosophy, how it came to existence. How much time do we have till your Salat? I guess it's 20 minutes left. 20 minutes? 20 minutes? Hello, do you have my voice? Yes. It's 15 minutes. Okay, so I continue. I continue and then uh, we don't need to have after Salat again uh, because Salat is going later, so we can continue. 